Hello everyone and welcome to today's uh, live Q&A with Peter Hahn. Um, basically, I hope you guys enjoyed his workshop. Um, before we get started with his live Q&A, I want to go over a couple of things with you guys. Make sure that uh, you enter your questions in the Q&A uh, fields off to the right on your screen. Um, also, uh, make sure you only ask one question at a time so that others can have a chance to ask their questions. Um, we're going to go in the order they're received. Um, and if you have a microphone, please let us know. If you don't have a microphone, please let us know so that we can basically allow you to talk to Peter directly using your microphone. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to uh, switch it over to Peter's screen so that you guys can start seeing what he has to, to show. And he'll give you a brief introduction about, you know, who he is and what he has done with the workshops and everything. So um, sit back, enjoy, and thank you for uh, signing into this live Q&A. Okay, Peter, uh, I switched the screen over to you. Okay. So. You guys see me? Uh, yes. All right, cool. All right, well, let's go. So if you can, just give us a brief introduction of... Hi, right. so you guys, uh, my name is Peter Hahn. I uh, well, uh, work at Tryon, which is the company I work at right now, the Tryon Worlds in San Diego. I'm a conceptual artist. Uh, I work in video games, basically, but I do a huge genre of different kinds of styles, and uh, my versatility in conceptual art is pretty broad, so I can tackle a lot of different kinds of stuff. But um, I attended Art Center back in 2004 is when I graduated. And uh, ever since then, for the last five years, I've been working in the game industry, uh, strictly concept art. And yeah, I really hope you guys enjoyed the uh, workshop, the short workshop. You know, I would have liked to have shared more, but of course, you know, the stuff I wanted to share was all foundation, quick sketching, observational stuff. Um, so yeah, uh, I can go through the website real quick if, if you guys haven't seen it, the kind of work that I do, just to give you a small sample of the kind of things that I have. Okay, you can go ahead, Peter, and show some stuff. Okay. This is actually stuff that I've done recently at Comic-Con. Uh, if you guys have not been to the San Diego Comic-Con, uh, I'm sure you've heard of it. It's a pretty big event. I'm there every year. Uh, I present as a professional artist. And this is the kind of stuff that I show. I mean, the, the stuff you've seen, uh, especially through the workshop, was all, um, it's, it's not realistic, it's not conceptual art, but it's all just basic drawing techniques. But it, it, it can apply to a lot of different styles. And I definitely try to reach out and try to do a lot of different kinds of things. So I'll do things that are more mechanical and serious like this, more texture heavy, or I'll go into something that's a lot more stylized and cartoony. So again, versatility. And of course, this is the field that I like to uh, try uh, one day as well, film and visual development. Again, more the uh, stylized visual style, uh, more the uh, animation film genre that I like to try. Let's try going down a little further, get into more of the sketching, drawing. Some more work that I've done, more character, creature designs. Now, I didn't really cover too much of the human anatomy or basic stuff like that, but again, um, the sketching style that I kind of like to teach, is it lends to well, all sorts of stuff. So. Here's the initial marker sketch that you see in the background, the full color one. The sketching style that I was teaching is everything right here. This is all this. So first you learn to, you know, be able to see, observe, draw things in life, and then start to, you know, create from your own imagination, apply the drawing techniques from there. Okay, Peter, uh, we have a couple questions that uh, popped up. Sure. Um, so I'll start off with um, 
with uh, Cesar Cavazos. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he doesn't have a mic, so I'm going to ask a question for him. Uh, he basically okay. asks, uh, what do you recommend to build a good portfolio if we are unexperienced in drawing and concept art? And do right. you uh, recommend another technique like sculpture to know better the structure of things? And he says, greetings. Um, let's tackle the first half of the question is the portfolio part of it. Um, more than anything, if you want to be specialized in something, you know, really focus on it. You know, there are people out there that want to strictly only do character design, creature design, vehicle design. If there's a particular uh, genre that you really enjoy, you know, really focus on it, but try to be the best that you can uh, out there for it because the competition for this kind of stuff is very fierce and there are people out there that are even, you know, ten times better than I am. So, um, more than anything, you really have to offer something that nobody else does, which is a hard thing to do, uh, especially trying to find your own style, your own voice, that kind of stuff. So when you're first starting out, it's all technical, foundation first. I mean, it's great if you want to focus on one particular uh, genre. Me, I do everything. I do the whole you know, spectrum, characters, vehicles, environments, uh, creatures, all that stuff. And that, that's really giving me a leg up to be able to find work because you know I can do everything. So if you can, make your portfolio versatile. Create your own stories, hit all the aspects, character design, creative design, uh, but make up your own small short stories, you know, and, and split up your portfolio in the sections of that that hit those stories, then you can, you know, start to tackle those genres. Uh, if you do want to just focus on a particular, you know, character design, then, then really be heavy on that. Give a lot of the foundation anatomy work. Uh, figure drawing, figure painting, and show that you are technically skilled first, especially if you're an amateur and you are just starting out. you got to show that you can just draw and paint, and that's more than anything the most important part. If anything, if there's one small thing you can add on, it's the idea that you can storytell. As a conceptual artist, being able to draw and paint is, is great. You have to have that. But being able to share stories, being able to share what's in your head is the most crucial aspect, I think, for a portfolio. Um, in terms of the sculpture, 3D part, um, if you're live sculpting, I mean, that's, I think it just shows, again, more of the versatility that you can do stuff like that. I don't think it's necessary. Um, if anything, I would probably learn 3D modeling. Um, a lot of concept artists these days go hand in hand with 3D. Uh, being able to conceptualize three dimensionally on the computer is, is a big thing. I don't do it personally, but it does. Um, make you a bit more attractive to companies that are looking for conceptual artists, especially for people that are just starting out. So um, if you can for a portfolio, keep it you know, simple, versatile, um, storytelling. But for the sculpting side, learn more of the 3D, I'd say. Okay. Thank you, Peter, for that. Uh, the next question we have is from Matthew uh, Sherman. Uh, he doesn't have a mic either, so I'm going to ask a question for him. Uh, he asked, how would you apply these techniques to sketching environments, e.g. forests, jungles, etc.? Well, environments, I would approach it the same way. Uh, you know, I said in the workshop where, you know, your organic stuff and the mechanical, mechanical stuff, there is no difference because you're building with shapes only. And you've got to approach it the same way with environments. You're just approaching it with simple shapes. And with any, more than anything with environments, it's got to be that initial read. Being able to um, lead the eye around the, the piece is, is very, very important. So structure, composition, uh, learning about foreground elements, middle ground elements, and background elements, and learning how to make those work together, um, organized so that you know, it doesn't look too um, flat or confusing. Not knowing where to look is, you know, it can hurt it. And going back to the idea of storytelling, it's that's a huge part of it. Uh, you know, each piece has to say something. It can't be just a flashy little image. It, it's, you know, it's got a. Let me see if I piece like a show. Uh, storytelling is probably more than anything the most important part for the environment piece. But for sketching, approach is simple. Again, this quick environment piece that I did, more of a stylized element. But I approach it, and if, if I was to draw this out, all these elements are extremely simplistic shapes. And it's all composition. And of course, you should know your perspective. Um, my class, or the workshop that I did, was more about eye and perspective. But with the environment pieces, you should probably definitely um, start to learn to plot your pieces out. 
um, understand good composition. That's all. Simplicity. Keep it simple. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Uh, the next question we have is from uh, Ottoman Fredrickson. Um, doesn't have a microphone. Uh, they ask, uh, well, say, great workshop, um, and great to have a resource on some of the basics. Uh, they were wondering if the exercise uh, would be just as effective if done digitally. Thanks. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's a bit more difficult when you're starting out with the Wacom tablet. For one, that disconnect is there from looking at the monitor and drawing with the tablet. If you can have access to a Cintiq, that's you know, way better because I work with a Cintiq personally myself at work and the transition from going to paper and digital on a Cintiq is, you know, it's, there is no transition. It's almost like drawing on paper. So if you have access to a Cintiq, you know, it's, you can work that way just as easily. The Wacom tablet, it takes a little bit more work to get used to, but it can be done. I do a lot of my work with the Wacom tablet, which is what I'm using right now. So let me pull up Photoshop real quick. Okay. And here's a small, quick, quick thing that I did. So, again, it can be done. Actually, if you can, if you can actually, uh, you can uh, go over a little more of your sketching um, in Photoshop. Uh, and while you do that, I'm going to ask all the attendees. There's quite a few of you there. Um, you can feel free to ask questions now. I only see a few of you actually did um, so far. So we have tons of space open for questions. If you have them, um, just type them in and let me know so I can uh, give you a chance to ask your question. Uh, back to you, Peter. Um, in terms of the digital side, I don't know. There really is no difference to it. It's, to me, it feels exactly the same. Again, that disconnect will be there initially, especially when with painting, it's a bit different because you can indicate the stroke a little easier. With drawing, you've got to be a little bit more precise. But um, the brush, uh, the kind of brush, the tool you're using will be important. For me, I just use a regular standard brush that comes with Photoshop, actually. Uh, it's this little hard brush right here. And it's almost like ink drawing. It's the exact same way. You know, I approach it. But it will get some use to time to get used to, but uh, it can definitely be done. And the speed does transfer right over. I think I drew a bird like this in the workshop, I don't remember. If that doesn't help, you know, it, tell me <laughs> if you need more info on that. But. Actually, I think that's really awesome, Peter. Um, uh, we actually have another question that came up. Um, basically, uh, Song Shen um, would like to know, and this actually is a future-looking question, um, uh, he wanted to know if it's possible for you to give a, a sneak peek or a basic outline of what you plan to do with the master classes. The master classes? Yeah, actually, I can. Um, with the classes themselves, I work through the chalkboard. So all the lessons plans I'll be approaching with the, the simple lines, the ellipses, the organic shapes, the hard shapes, I do all on the chalkboard. And um, for me, it's it's interesting drawing on a chalkboard. You have that. You have to work oppositely, definitely. But um, it definitely shows this, the skill set that it does actually work on any kind of medium: chalkboard, paper, digital, and it transfers over everywhere. Um, working with ellipses, the, the five different shapes, the simple forms, the line work going over the lines eight times. You know everything. Um, if you take the, the work, the actual classes themselves, I will be doing demos on chalkboards also. So you'll definitely get a sense of the kind of um, work I would be doing in an actual class. But this is the kind of stuff you'll see. This is the formula, how the cubes in perspective. And I'll do random drawings like this straight here and I'll put them all over. I think I have more chalk drawings. Okay. 
we have uh, another question from Miguel Uvio. Um Miguel didn't tell me if he had a mic or not, so I'm going to ask him to say hello if he does. Miguel, are you there? Yeah, yeah. Okay, can you speak a little bit louder and closer to your microphone so we can hear you? Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Uh, uh, are you hearing me? Yes, I can hear you. Ah, okay. Uh, I was, uh, uh, first of all, I want to say a great workshop. Oh, thank you. Glad to attend it. And um, another thing, uh, how did you break in the industry? How did I break it? Well, yeah. I graduated at the end of 2004 at Art Center. And initially, I actually wasn't working for about five months because I was building my own small little portfolio. I included a lot of work from school, obviously. And how I initially started was I did freelance work, contract jobs. And the way I did that was I sent my work everywhere. Um, a good approach is if, I mean, you have access to so much information online with any of these companies. Um, even if they're not posting work or asking for conceptual artists, send your work to them anyways. You know, let them know that you're out there. Mm -hmm. And eventually, you may not get a full-time job. That's, that's not even what you should be thinking about, just getting breaking in, just getting some kind of work, even if it's just a small freelance gig, is what's most important. So just send your work out to any company that's listed or even, you know, to your interest, the kind of games that they make, or even company, whatever. Um, and just, you know, make sure your work is getting out there portfolio-wise. If it's an online blog, if it's an actual website, just send it out there so they know you're there. And then if, if they do need somebody, you, you might just get a phone call one day. Unfortunately, it can be a lot of luck at times. They have to be in the right place at the right time, which is unfortunate. And also another unfortunate thing is you have to know the person. So connections is a very big thing. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. More than anything, if, if you go to school, obviously your connections are your classmates, the person next to you. So when you guys graduate, you know, somebody else gets work, you have a connection there. And for me, it was just finding freelance jobs and you know, small gigs here and there. And the way it happened for me was I got my first freelance job through a company called Technicolor in Burbank. And it was a freelance job at first, but then it turned into a full-time gig you know, after a few months. So more than anything, it's just get your stuff out there, um, your portfolios, online blogs, talk to your friends who've already graduated with you, or if, if you have friends in the industry, just, you know, just mm -hmm. hope for the best. <laughs> it is yeah. luck, too. So be patient and just don't try to, try to rush it. And it is frustrating because the work right now, it, the industry is kind of slow a little bit. But it will pick up again. It always does. So. Okay. okay, thank you. Not a problem. All right, Peter, thank you for that answer. Um, our next question is coming from uh, Michael uh, in San Diego, I'm assuming. Uh, he doesn't have a mic, um, but he has quite a lengthy question, so bear with me as I read it all. Okay. Uh, uh, he says, my name is Mike... S oh, it is San Diego. Sorry, okay. okay. My name is Mike San Diego, and I wanted to know what you would suggest for someone who wants to break into the entertainment business, but does not live um, in the area where there are any studios available. Right. Um, one second. He also asks, uh, this is the case for me being in Michigan in the Detroit area. I have a, a firm background having drawn for 10 years, and I'm looking to a uh, CG workshop to hopefully fill in some of the, uh, the blanks. Um, so to speak, and hope to be marketable soon. Any advice would be great. Um, and this workshop today was a wonderful start. I just know uh, who I really should contact being located uh, so far from California. Oh, yes, I don't know who I should uh, contact being so far from California. Um, yeah, being that close to the industry, it, it can be difficult. That doesn't mean there's not work out there in the Mideast or anywhere else out in the, in the States, because there is a lot of work out there outside of California. Uh, but again, things like this, these online workshops, uh, is a huge, huge benefit, even if you're doing like DVDs from other companies as well. But definitely you know, something like this where there's not really too much of this kind of stuff out there where you have access to online blogs or not online blogs, but workshops and classes. So take advantage of this kind of stuff while it's here, especially with you know, stuff that I'm teaching. This is the kind of stuff you don't really have access to in any of the school. Uh, I only teach at two places, which is Art Center and the CDA Concept Design Academy. And now I'm starting to teach it here. You have, now that you have access to it online, definitely take advantage of it because uh, it is the stuff I'm teaching is extremely crucial. Um, more than anything, it's, it's 
if you have the opportunity to ever come out, <laughs> definitely do. Uh, but again, like I said, I've applied to many different companies outside of California, and there are out there many of them that are growing. And um, uh, what was the second part of the question, Ted? Uh, well, basically, it was along the same lines of just in general because he lives out of state, and he wanted yeah. to know, you know, uh, like okay. how did he, how does he go about getting contacts, being where he's at with people here in right. California, you know? Uh, well, if if you have been drawing and working with your, on your own personal stuff for a while, and you start to build up that confidence in your own work, um, obviously you have a huge access and database of other artists and stuff online. Definitely look at what they're doing and what you're doing, and just be honest with yourself and, and see, do, do you compare, can you compete with the people that are out here right now? Because um, it is, it's just a competition to game. And again, like I said, you have to be able to offer something uh, that's up to what's being out there or even better, or just something different. So um, doing it that way, you, you couldn't, you can get noticed. People will, if, especially if you're sending out your, your contacts and your blogs and your websites out to just companies straight up and just letting them know uh, what your work consists of, then obviously you will be noticed. Uh, getting to know people, uh, contacts and stuff, for me it was all through school, just going to school and talking to the, my, my own personal peers who graduate together. That, that those are your contacts really. For me, I've built up recently a lot of my own contacts through Comic-Con, uh, being able to start to show my work personally through uh, a convention like that, you know, a really big convention, being, it helps me start to build my own contacts in a much more professional manner. But for somebody who's just starting out, it's got to be the person next to you, the student, the classmate, even a roommate or someone that you draw with all the time. Uh, I have a personal friend who's become a close contact of mine who grew up together in high school and we're both conceptual artists. So um, again, it's you just got to keep an eye open, uh, be open-minded, and just talk to a lot of people. The um, thing about conceptual artists and artists in general is that the great artists, drawers, you know, painters, whatever, but some of them just can't talk to people. <laughs> you got to be able to talk to people and communicate. Not only communicate through drawing, but be able to communicate through words. So, yeah, I hope that helps a little bit. Yeah, I think that does cover quite a bit. And also, I wanted to add that he he could also try going to several conferences. Uh, that Absolutely, are yeah. Hosted throughout the the year as well. Um, mm -hmm. I know with the evolve, they have quite a few uh, presentations and things uh, and job fairs. Uh, so I would say check that out as well. Um, our next question is from uh, Victor Ha. Uh, I'm not sure Victor has a microphone, so Victor, if you're there, can you say hello? Victor? Victor, are you there? Doesn't sound like it. Okay, so I don't think Victor has a mic, but I'll ask a question. Um, okay. As a concept development student, I have to do many character turnarounds. I have trouble when a gesture is complicated. How would you keep the character turning in two-dimensional space when the gesture is very complicated? Should I just simplify the pose? Um, if you have, well, if you have a bit of 3D background, which you know, if, if I'm assuming you do, then build your character out in 3D. Turn that and, and just draw over it. If you don't have access to something like that, Find somebody who does, who can help you with that. If not, um, for me, here's a sample of like a creature that I did of a turnaround. Um, yeah, it's got to be simplistic. It's, you got to, here, let me get this straight up. Again, build it with shapes. If you're, if you're doing a full turnaround, side, front, back, if you're doing a three-quarter as well, uh, it's gonna be all. It's gonna be you know very complicated at first because if you're drawing lines out to match up everything, simplify it really with, with only just shapes and just line everything up the best you can. It's gonna be very time consuming and orthographics in general are time consuming. So um, I don't know what else to really tell you other than the fact that you know it's just <laughs> hunker down and and brew a nope. <laughs> cup of coffee <laughs> and it really just you know hammer it out. Uh, it, it, it takes trial and error. You're going to mess up a couple times, and I've done it where it's like I'll start a pose, and I'll try to do a turnaround on it, and it just doesn't match up, and I have to start over again. And it, it really is a trial and error process for me personally. 
because it's, it really is just a difficult process. Thank you, Peter. That was awesome. Um, the next question is from uh, Ismail Wamala. Uh, they don't have a microphone, so I'm going to ask their question. Um, they say, not sure if this was asked, uh, how many pieces should a design portfolio contain? 15 pieces of each subject matter, vehicles, robots, costumes, environments, props? Um, my own personal portfolio was about 24 pages, uh, 24 pages total, but I guess you have to multiply that because it's a front and back piece. It was, it was a pretty big portfolio. Um, if you can, my own personal portfolio covered a lot of aspects. Uh, this blog actually is my own portfolio, so this is what you would see in my own book. So the way I had structured it out was um, about every four pages was its own little uh, piece, like a short story that I had done. So for instance, this is the nomad section right here that would be in my book. I created a short story. I have one environment piece, one character piece with sketches to back it up, one creature piece and sketches to back that up. This is probably a bit more, so it's about three, six, seven pieces right here. And I have several stories that, that hit different genres. So this is more of like, this is the nomad, more of the fantasy kind of style. And then I do one that's more sci-fi. So this is like the racer uh, storyline that I've done. So I've done pilots with racer planes, with the environment piece. So I had a total of maybe four or five short storylines that I've done in my portfolio that hit every aspect of you know, conceptual art, character, creature, environment, vehicle, all that stuff. Just again, to show that I can story and tell and be versatile and design, basically be able to draw and design anything. Uh, yeah, I guess I hope that answers the question. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Peter. Um, our next question is from uh, Junko. Uh, he says, hi, Peter. Thanks for the wonderful workshop. My question is, what do visual development departments and animation studios look for in a portfolio? <laughs> that actually is a similar question. So what would you say they require most uh, mostly realistic environment painting, or is it better to show more stylized or your own uh, style illustrations with both environments and characters? That would really depend on the company you're applying to. Um, for one thing, again, like I said, it really understand what you want to do first. If you want to be focused in a particular genre, really, really focus on it. And look for a company that tailors to the style that you're doing. Obviously, if you do something that's more video game style, like robots and sci-fi stuff, you don't want to apply for DreamWorks because they do more of the animation, visual development style. So really pick and choose a company that, you know, look at the games that they produce or the movies that they produce. And obviously, it's got to be an interest to you to want to work at a place that, you know, works on something that's similar to your own particular style. So look at your own work, research the company, um, and then just apply it that way. Uh, more than anything, if it's a particular company that is looking for like sci-fi or fantasy stuff, then obviously you've got to have a book full of just that stuff. If you're applying for a Blizzard, for instance, you want to show a lot of fantasy dragons, ogres, knights in armor, that kind of stuff. Uh, again, it really does depend on the kind of company of who you're going to apply to. So research beforehand before you apply. If you send in a portfolio that doesn't match at all, they're not going to really pay attention to you. So. Thanks, Peter. Um, we're going to go back up to a, a, a question uh, Cesar asked earlier. Um, it says, for you, what was your best work and what websites do you recommend uh, for us uh, uh, for reference? Um, artists, draw, uh, drawings, real reference, you know. And he says, excellent workshop. Oh, thank you. Um, let's see, for reference in terms of online, for me, my reference is the whole world. I mean, I, I do only go online if I need a particular uh, subject matter or a particular piece I need to look at for reference. Um, obviously, you know, the stuff I talked about in the workshop, you got to be just observant of your surroundings constantly. I mean, you'll be inspired by the smallest thing that you see. Um, but obviously, if you're doing character designs, you know, like the website was that blog, uh, the, the character design blog spot, they constantly post references of anatomy of people and poses and costumes. Uh, Go to workshops also at local to your schools. Um, people, I'm sure they have you know three-hour workshops that are set up for anatomy drawing. Um, a lot of schools do that. And a lot of times they don't post it, advertise it, but it, it's definitely there. I'm sure. Um, what was the other part of the question, Ted? 
Uh, one second. Um, it was um, just, I guess, general reference uh, resources like sites and um, like like pictures. Or, like, what do you get? Uh, like, what do you recommend for them to use for references for the for of different artists or drawings and and. Okay. Um, well, it's. I mean, let's say if I was researching a bird like this, a sketch that I'm doing. Obviously, I just go into Google, type in a particular bird that I'm looking for. Like this one, I'm inspired by a bird that's called the pied hornbill. And you know, you can find these at a zoo. Go on locations. Go out there and research. Um, looking at images online definitely helps because it's so fast and interactive like that. But for me, I always like to be on location for certain things. I mean. Any, wherever you guys are, anywhere you live, there are obviously museums, and, you know, zoos, all those kind of places exist. Go to those places and draw. You know, take your own photographs, take your own reference, uh, build up your own collection. Uh, even if you're doing environment pieces, go out there, you know, different kinds of locations and forests and beaches and anchor, you know, take your own reference shots. That way, you know, you can use your own photographs in, in, in a way that's more tailored to what you really want to do instead of hunting for, you know, photographs especially small full of photographs that you can't really use a lot of the times uh, to be included into your design. So for me, it's, it's a lot of on location, walking around, um, exploring, going to different places and really interacting with what's really out there. Um, I think people need to you know, stretch and get out there and walk around and just be observant of your surroundings. Awesome. Thank you, Peter. Um, our next question is from Eric. Uh, he asks, uh, what do you think of using the iPad as a platform for sketching? You know what, I actually just tried that today. Uh, I was really interested in that myself. I wish Wacom would put out their own little uh, device for sketching. I'm sure they have the technology, but <laughs> I don't know why they're not putting anything out like that. I've tried the iPad. If it worked like the Wacom tablet, I would buy it in an instant. And I, I would still draw on paper, definitely. But to be able to draw digitally, I mean, it would be such a huge advantage. And if it works for you, if you think it, you know, uh, some of the, the devices I've used, they're okay. They're not perfect yet. I think they'll get there eventually. But once they do, yeah, I'll transfer. I'll, I'll make that move. I'll buy it. <laughs> awesome. Our next question is going back uh, to uh, uh, to Autumn. Uh, aside from the usual. Uh, uh, catering a portfolio to a studio, is there any advice you can offer for those of us working on breaking into the industry, especially, okay, this is similar to the one we asked earlier. Uh, is, is basically asking, is there anything that you could recommend for them to do that live outside of Southern California? So I think we kind of addressed it already, Autumn. Um, but if you can, Peter, just a quick little uh, recap, if possible. Mm. Well, I don't know really how to answer that any different other than the fact that uh, the whole online thing is probably the biggest advantage that you're going to have. Yeah, you're not going to be able to, you don't have close contacts and communications with people in California, but you can get access to them online. So, um, you know, things like this through the workshop, you know, it's, you're, you're getting interaction with professional artists and people out here right now. So. Um, I don't know, I think this would be a good chance to be able to build contact this way where it's just on through, it's the through websites where if you want to contact a company, literally just contact them, email them. Some people are, are a little hesitant of contacting companies, but they feel like, oh, they're not going to care. Why would they want to listen to some amateur artists? Send your work anyways. You know, even if you think they're not going to listen, you, you got to make that first step. Okay. Um, I have another question from Miguel. He says, I love to draw traditionally. Uh, what role does digital uh, make in your workflow and how does it influence it? Um, obviously speed. It, it definitely speeds me up a lot faster. Uh, to, when you're drawing on paper, I used to do this when I was working professionally as well. I would draw on paper with markers and pens. And I, I still love to do that. But then you got to scan it, clean it up, and then you know, draw over that again, paint it. So you you skip a lot of steps when you're going straight digital and I don't see it as a hindrance or anything like that again the, the computer digital is just another tool and that's just the way I see it 
it doesn't make one person better. Um, you still have to have the same skill sets. You have to have that foundation of being able to draw for it to transfer over and see. Um, there are a lot of people out there that are very flashy and very good with Photoshop. They can do a lot of cool effects with it. But in the end, I mean, uh, having really good foundational drawing skills will transfer over to your digital stuff as well. It'll make it look that much better. Awesome. Um, our next question is from Ismaya again. Uh, he says, many thanks for the workshop, uh, very informative. Uh, the question is, in a studio situation, is there a quota of the pieces you have to complete by the end of the day or week? And are you generating ideas Monday through Friday in a studio situation? Oh, yeah. I mean, I work a full-time job right now, so I'm there Monday through Friday. And right now, currently, I'm designing a lot of weapons for a game that I'm working on. But... Um, it really all depends on the kind of schedule you're on, the kind of person you're dealing with. Uh, again, every company is different with the people you're working with, uh, with your art directors, your producers, and all that kind of stuff. So one place can be a little bit more relaxed. Other places can be a lot more intense. Um, and it varies quite a bit. So the place I'm doing right now, it's pretty actually intense. Uh, for instance, I'll give you an example. I'm working on weapon designs, like I said. They'll give me, uh, on average, four days to complete one weapon and that's from the initial sketch to the refined design to the um, full color and then I'll do a three, three quarter but then also you have to consider the fact that there's back and forth people want changes and it more than anything speed will help a lot you just got to be real quick when you're in the industry because um, being able to draw, uh, draw fast will help you change your, your designs quickly too because there will always be changes and you have to be able to roll with the punches being able to compensate. I'm sure a lot of you know designers and artists out there are very stubborn headed about their designs, they don't want to change it. But when you're first starting out as an artist, you gotta be able to suck up your pride and say, okay, you know, maybe your life is gonna look better this way and you just do it. So um, yeah. Thank you, Peter. Um, and for everyone that's uh, in, uh, attending the uh, live QA, again you can ask questions. We have lots of slots open still. Um, I see quite a few who are there just are not asking any questions, so you're just probably watching Peter draw, which is still cool, you know, but again, <laughs> you can ask questions. Um, I have a, a question for you, Peter. What was your main source of inspiration, you know, to even get into concept design? Initially, I wanted to do comic books. I wanted to draw, uh, you know, Marvel superheroes and all that kind of stuff, which I actually kind of do a little bit right now uh, with a friend, but um, it probably changed from looking at comics and then watching movies. So film was a huge, huge influence. And of course, you know, the video game revolution happened, so gaming was a huge part of it as well. But initially, you know, going from high school, I wanted to be a comic book illustrator. Going to college, Art Center, I think that's where it kind of flipped, where I started to be introduced to more of what conceptual design is and what it consists of. And pretty much that's where it started for me. So. Thank you for that, Peter. Um, another question we'd like to ask is, uh, what's your favorite uh, subject matter or genre to, to illustrate or draw? A lot of people ask me that, actually. Uh, they say, you know, what, what's your strongest field? What are you really good at? And for me, I've always been glad to say that there is no one particular thing that I'm strong at because I can do everything. <laughs> um, again, it's that strength and versatility, being able to be confident in the fact that you know there is nothing out there that I can't draw because it's all the same to me. Uh, from drawing this bird to something drawing uh, more mechanical or uh, sci-fi heavy, it doesn't really matter to me. So I don't have a favorite. I love to draw it all, and keeping it different like that keeps it fresh for me. Because if I'm drawing one particular thing for you know, months on end, I'll get sick of it. So I need to be able to break out and be able to draw a lot of different things so that it keeps it fresh for me. Okay, thank you, Peter. Um, we have a new question from uh, Muhammad Jafar. Uh, he says, hi, Peter. You spoke about mileage and sketching. What's your daily routine when it comes to your warm-ups and just practicing on your sketches? How long would it take you, and how long would you suggest beginners to start with? Um, yeah, mileage is a huge, huge key. For me, when I initially started with Art Center, you know, um, Art center itself was like a job. Uh, I was drawing constantly. 
especially for this class when I first initially took it with my own personal instructor uh, Norm. You know, I it's I tell you right now, it's a lot. A lot of it has to do with hunger. Um, I can when I teach right now and I, I interact with students, I can tell who's going to take it far and who's not. Uh, and it has to do with hunger and how much you really want it. Um, so it's a personal drive. Uh, but for me, like right now, I get a lot of my practice basically just teaching, being able to draw on the chalkboard, you know, every weekend and then drawing constantly through the work week. I'm drawing a lot, so that in itself is my own practice. When I was in school, uh, you know, I'd be spending so many, many, many hours, you know, endless nights just drawing constantly. Uh, there really is no limit to how much you should do. If you felt like you've drawn enough, draw more. <laughs> awesome. Uh, we have an, a new question from um, Ricardo, uh, who asks, uh, as an illustrator, how important is it to have uh, a style to work in the games, movie, or games or movie industry? And he asks, is it better to be more versatile? Yeah, being versatile is, is really important because that opens you up to be able to work, um, you know, in different genres. So they, the, you know, people out there in the industry are looking for one particular style of artist. So let's say one company is looking for a character designer and you get a freelance job for that, you can work for that. But then another company comes along and says, oh, we're looking for a vehicle designer. You can say yes to that as well because you can do that. So being versatile will give you a lot more different opportunities to work for different companies and just have a lot more basic opportunities, I guess. Um, if you're focused on one style or one genre and some guy comes along and asks you, can you do an environment piece for me? And you say no, well, then there's a lost job, a lost you know, contact. So definitely keep it versatile. Uh, if there's something that you find difficult, you're afraid to do, overcome it. You know, uh, really um, practice on something that you're uncomfortable with. You know, for me initially it was environments. I was very uncomfortable with environments because I couldn't do them very well. I still can't do it as good as you know a lot of other people out there. But I try my best, and I, I still tackle it because it, it may be an uncomfortable zone. But I know if I were to keep doing it, I know I'll be able to still get more work because of that. Um, in terms of styles, mostly in, in the video game industry, there really isn't too much of a style. I mean, they do create style guides, but you, you develop those as you work with the company. Um, so if you were to go into animation or film, obviously that's a bit more of like a dog or a Bible where you have to kind of follow their specific style that, that they create. So um, for me, I've always been able to adapt pretty easily. And I think that word adaptability is, is pretty important. Uh, more than anything, just be versatile in the kind of genres you can do first and then think about styles later. All right. Thanks for that answer, Peter. Um, our next question is from Fernando Acosta. Um, says, hi, Peter. Thanks for the great workshop. It was a nice compliment to your Nomen tutorial. Uh, I was wondering, how was your experience working with Mark Garner, and how did that come about? Any clue if the BTS short is coming out anytime soon? <laughs> <laughs> um, wow, well, that project's been in the works for a long time. I started that back in, was 06 now? It's been a long time. And being able to work with Mark, I mean, he's just an amazing conceptual artist, because he also can do, he's also very versatile, he can do uh, characters, creatures, environments, props, weapons really, really well. And uh, his work always blows my mind because you know, I saw his personal work and I was just like, oh my god, there's no way I can compete. And I still can't compete with someone like him because that guy is just, one, he has a lot more experience than I do. And just, you know, some people are obviously out there in, in the industry, it's, you're always going to find somebody that's way better than you. And he's one of those kind of guys that just blows so many people away. And I look up to him, his work is, is very inspirational. Um, so it was a you know big honor for me to at least be able to just be within his presence and, and for him to see my work and give me pointers and all that kind of stuff. So uh, he was great, definitely. In terms of the BTS, I guess that will really depend on. <laughs> I don't know really. I, I guess we're still kind of working on it, but um, it was fun for me. I mean, that experience was a lot of fun. We had a lot of laughs, and I don't know. It was, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> And um, actually, I won't add anything to that. I'll leave it alone. 
uh, our next question is from Rena Chang. Um, Rena asks, uh, when you say mileage, do you mean just drawing as much as possible? And what should a beginner be drawing anyway? Mileage is another word, I guess, for practice, definitely. Um, in terms of what you'd be start, starting with, you know, with the workshop that I had, being able to at least, you know, understand the materials you're using, and then the most foundational stuff like lines, ellipses, circles, uh, just being comfortable in the fact that um, you're not going to sit there and noodle it, like, you know, scratching away and trying to find the form, that you can be confident and hit those shapes and forms without being able to think too much. Um, so it's also, I mean, going out on location is a huge part of it as well. For me, it's um, practicing drawing observationally first helps a lot, and then it kind of transfers over to being able to draw with your imagination. Um, so mileage is just practice. Practice a lot, draw a lot. Uh, wherever you are, always have a book or at least pens on you. So even if you're just drawing on napkins, I do that a lot, especially when we go to a restaurant or something like that. I'm constantly drawing. Even if I'm not drawing on paper, I'm thinking about it in my head. It, with this class, it's kind of weird because you see things differently. After a while, you, you go out you know, on the streets, and you start to just break things down into the most specific forms. And I do that constantly. I'll look at, you know, any shape or any object, and I just do it automatically. I don't even think about it. It's like, oh, that's, I don't even consider it sometimes. I just, I really, I'll, I'll realize it that I'm doing it. And the more you do it, you'll start to do it yourself, and uh, it just makes you that much faster and, and better as a sketch artist. So. Awesome. Thank you, Peter. Um... Our next question is from Sar Botman. Um, I'm not sure if they have a mic. So, uh, Sar, if you're there, can you say hello? Hello? Hey. Hi. How's it going, man? Pretty good. How are you? Pretty good. All right. Our question was just um, how important do you think it is to finish your art education before jumping on the first job offer that comes along with, say, you're in... That's a good question. That's a very good question. Um, I've actually, I know a lot of people that have done that where, you know, they'll start school and they get a job offer halfway through and they, they take it, they've taken it. And in my personal opinion, um, definitely look at the opportunity, see if it's something that's going to, you know, grow into something. Look at the potential of what the job is. If it's like a small freelance gig, I would say pass it up. If it's a full-time job, you know, into a big project, I would definitely consider it. Um, with education, you can always go back and finish it. You know, with job opportunities, they only come once in a you know, moon sometimes. So it's it's always good to be able to, to take that risk and jump on it. Uh, you know, one thing it's risks are can reap benefits, so don't be afraid to do that kind of stuff. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, our next question, I'm going to go back up to one Miguel asked earlier. Uh, basically, he says, in my country, there aren't concept art programs, so I'm going to take a master's in illustration. Do you consider those skills of an illustrator important while working as a concept artist? Yeah, absolutely, because I myself was an illustration student at Art Center. Uh, there, at the time when I was taking the Art Center, there was no entertainment track. I had to create my own track in terms of entertainment design. So when I was at Art Center, I was a illustration major. So when I first started, my first half of my education was, you know, painting, drawing, foundation of uh, human anatomy, uh, color, composition. So that definitely helped me a lot. But I also expanded my education and, and sought out different kinds of, um, I guess, well, not just illustration based, but I did a lot of design work as well. So I went to product design, industrial design, and I've tailored my own education to what I wanted to be. So, um, if if you don't have entertainment in you know where you are, and you, you know if you have something like illustration, definitely take that because those kind of skills will help. No matter what kind of education you're getting, if it's industrial design, car design, uh, product design, illustration, those skills that you're learning in any kind of uh, track are going to help as a designer. Expose yourself to everything and every, anything, uh, because the more you see, the better you'll get. Thank you, Peter. That was a great answer. 
Um, our next question, I'm going to jump back up to Ismael Lamalas. Uh, is ask, uh, as an in-house concept artist, are there times where you are required to do overtime? If so, what situation would call for overtime from a concept artist? Um, I have done some overtime uh, at the company I'm at right now. The schedule is, is, is pretty harsh, but I haven't had to actually you know, put in a lot more work than I have to. Uh, more than anything, it, it just happens where if you get behind and you have to catch up, you always got to put in hours. The only problem with the game industry is that they don't compensate you for that kind of stuff um, in terms of pay. So you are obviously working for free for them. But if you care about the project, you'll want to do it because you want to see the project done. Um, if you're an hourly contract kind of person and you put in more hours, obviously you get paid more. So that's a benefit towards you. But to, in terms of where I am at right now, if I were to put in hours over time, weekends and stuff like that, I only do it because you know I, I want to see the project done and I care about it. So. Um, it was a case where, you know, when I was working at Technicolor, I, I would definitely put in a lot of work in terms of stuff that was just, there was just so much to do and there was enough people to do it. You kind of had to suck it up and do it. And especially when you're first starting out, I think you kind of have to put in your, your time and, and dues uh, before you start to demand a little more. So. All right. Thanks for that, Peter. Um, I'm going to go back to a question Michael has. Actually, it's a two-part question. Um, the first part is, uh, let me see here, I have a lot of experience with figure drawing and anatomy in particular, but what would you suggest to strengthening uh, figure drawing from your imagination? Um, and the second part of the question is, you mentioned insects as a good starting point to branch out towards more mechanical things. Are there any other things you can suggest to draw to uh, help in developing an aptitude towards mechanical drawing? Um, let's see. So the first one had to do with the figure drawing from imagination. What would you do to right. strengthen that? Uh, in terms of strengthening drawing from imagination with figure drawing, uh, if you're confident with your figure drawing skills when you're drawing from life, I think it should start to automatically transfer over into your imagination and drawing. Um, if it's not and you're having a hard time with that, then um, I would say actually start writing. Create your own stories. Uh, with characters, when you're designing something from, from your imagination, you know, just imagining something visually only takes you so far. You kind of have to design and develop and create much more content behind what that character is in terms of even the personality of the character. To start to be able to see what you're trying to design. So um, for me, I do, you know, I'll, I'll do some writing, but I definitely do a lot of note taking in my books and sketchbooks where I'll think of something like, okay, I can use this later on for a character. So a lot of note-taking helps when you're designing something from your imagination. So um, a lot of people tend to just sit there and try to draw a sketch. And I tell you, a lot of times you just hit a, a, a wall. You won't be able to draw because you can't think of anything. You have to build up basically a, a category or a, a list or um, basically a catalog, a book of stuff that you you know, note take on basically and, and be able to, I don't know, uh, lean towards to be able to help you design stuff. So for me, a lot of note taking. The second part, what was it? Oh, the second part was uh, read it to you mentioning how um, they should it's draw mechanical from, stuff. Yes, mechanical. Insects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the insects were, I mean, for me it helped a lot. But if you're having, again, trouble with that, on-site drawing helps a lot. Obviously, if you're drawing from uh, life, like cars and, and uh, tanks, uh, yeah, I don't know how, how much of access you would have to like military stuff, but you can always go to like, the local museums, uh, military museums, or plane museums. And that's definitely a great way to start. If you're trying to draw from the imagination, obviously you're going to go with something more sci-fi, something like you know, something doing that right now. But I'll read a lot of books, too. You know, look at different artists' inspiration in terms of that. Um, the sci-fi stuff and the mechanical stuff, it's a huge, it's a difficult transition. Some people have a better time with the mechanical side, other people have a better time with the organic side, and they have that weird transition where they'll start strong on one end and then they kind of stumble at the other. So um, if you find that you're stumbling on one particular side, let's say your mechanical side, definitely focus on that a little bit more and um, expose yourself to many different kinds of artists, more uh, 
it, it's going to be a lot more technical in terms of drawing. So really focus on your perspective. Learn how to eye perspective really well, and um, learn how to just start. Well, it applies to both, but being able to draw real simply. Okay, thank you, Peter. Um, our next question is from Oliver. Uh, Oliver asks, uh, what is the difference between designing for video games and de designing for animation? Um, with games, I don't know, I guess it depends. I mean, certain in the gaming industry, it's, it's very similar to actually making like films, but you're the genre and the, and the styles can be very, very, very different. Whereas if you go into animation, they're very specific on what they do. Um, they're both storytelling, so uh, that's not too much different there. But you'll be, I'm not sure how to put it, but I guess it'd be more of a hand in the game industry where you're not creating, the ideas will be already done for you, so you kind of have to be the person just to just develop the look of it. Whereas in animation and film, you kind of have to be more of a storyteller and uh, uh, design the emotion behind what those characters are going to be like. Because you've got to create, create a lot of content with your video games, whereas with film, it's very, very specific at what it needs. So. Awesome. Um, our next question um, is from Junko. Um, he asks, again, uh, if you don't hear back anything from companies for a while after sending your portfolio, how long would you say to wait to sending another one? To the same company? Uh, I'm assuming to the same company, yeah. I wouldn't send a portfolio, well, let's say you send a portfolio out to one company and you don't hear back. I would say wait about, uh, I don't know, three or four days at the most and just email them back. Just ask them, you know, did you receive, you know, my portfolio? Just wondering if you got it and don't send it to them again. Uh, I would just try to communicate with them through email and just make sure that, you know, they got it. If they got it, they'll most likely tell you that, you know, they did get it and they looked through whatever and would we'll just, well, they'll give you a small excuse, but <laughs> don't be offended by it. Um, again, it, it just follow through after about three or four days. Just email only. Don't really just send you, don't send the whole, another link of your work again to them. So more, more than likely they'll have gotten it. And if you don't hear anything, don't, I would just say move on to try other places. Okay, and there's a second part to the question that he added. Um, he says, do you recommend a physical printed portfolio or sending one online? That does depend on the company. Some companies will ask for hard uh, copies. Uh, the hard copy can even be like a burn or a DVD of your work. But more than likely nowadays, it's, it's straight digital. It's all online websites and blogs. For me, it's, I have a, a, an actual printed portfolio though. But I'll only take those if I get an interview. More than anything, it's I just send out online blogs, links to these companies. That's all I would send out. Okay. Um, Miguel has a, an interesting question. Um, he says, essentially, I'm self-taught, um, but I would like to teach. Or well, I like to teach a lot. Uh, how, do you, uh, how did you get your teaching gig at the Art Center? Um, well... I used to TA for my teacher, my instructor, which is the class that I'm teaching now was the VizCon 4, which is this dynamic sketching. And uh, I would TA for him a lot, and I would actually cover for him several times if he had to go on business trips or whatever, so he needed somebody to cover. And that was actually my first initial experience of just teaching. Um, I even did, you know, um, public speaking for like high schools and stuff like that. I would go to different high schools and, and just do small workshops where you know, I might not get paid, but still I'm just trying to get that experience of interacting with people. Um, for me, it was an unfortunate event where my instructor was killed, so I kind of had to debate. Art Center had asked me to take over because me and him had always talked about uh, taking over for his class and actually developing another one with him. But now that he wasn't he, now he's not here, they need somebody to replace him, so they had asked me to do it. Okay, and I think our last question will be, um, what is your favorite piece but have you like of all the drawings and illustrations you've made do you have a favorite piece a particular piece that I've done uh, yes let me see I don't know if there's anything on my blog that I, I mean I like all the stuff that I've worked maybe not a particular piece but maybe the project that I've worked on that I've enjoyed so there hasn't been an individual piece that I've always kind of favored towards 
but there have been projects that are really, really are, are fun to. Um, there was a one particular project that worked at the company, which was the Warhawk game. I really enjoyed developing vehicles and stuff for this particular game. When I hit a lot of different aspects of it, you know, the weapon designs, the vehicle designs, um, it was a really good learning experience for me. Um, but no, there really is no one particular piece that I really felt attached to. For me, I, I don't really feel attached to any piece because, uh, you know, a lot of artists are very protective of their work. For one, they don't want to show their skills, they don't want to share the methods that they've done. And they feel like they're losing something if they, you know, if they somehow lose the piece. But for me, it's like, if I were to draw, you know, this and I deleted it without saving, I really don't care. Even if it was a completely full painted piece, I really wouldn't care because I could do it again. And I don't feel any kind of attachment to any of this kind of stuff. And um, a lot of artists can't do that. Um, some can, some don't. For me, I do. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, Peter. Well, we've basically reached our, our time limit. So I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's live Q&A. Um, for those of you who have uh, not yet uh, seen any of the, of the workshops, I would say go to our CGMW online uh, website and check out the other workshops that are still available for purchase. Um, also, the, the live Q&As from last week will be made available uh, this Monday. And those uh, from yesterday and today will be made available at the end of the week. So check back on the site for those. Um, and again, I'd like to thank Peter for just an amazing workshop and for participating in our live Q&A. Um, thank you, Peter, and, and, and no, great work. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Uh, really appreciate it. No problem. Um, and, yeah, that concludes our workshop for today. Thank you.